Hi, my name is Nick Huntington Klein. Uh, welcome to this video from my series of videos on my book, The Effect, which is all about how to do causal inference and research design. Uh, in this video, we're gonna be talking about how to describe variables. Uh, we know that we have variables that we have measured, we have a bunch of data, and we want to be able to tell somebody what is in that data. That's the whole point of what we are doing, right? We have a bunch of data, we have thousands of observations of whatever it is that we have, uh, and we wanna tell somebody was in those observations without just making them look through them one at a time and try to make sense of them in their own head, because uh, it's just hard for us to make much sense of all of that. Uh, so when we're doing this, we're going to need to think about what is the distribution of a variable. That's the key idea that we're going to get at here, that variables have distribution. Uh, what a distribution of a statistical variable is, is it something that tells you how often different values tend to occur. So the classic example is a coin flip. If you flip a coin, uh, there is a 50% chance that it will be heads and a 50% chance that it will be tails, at least if it is a fair coin. Uh, that is the distribution of outcomes for that coin. It tells you for any given possible outcome that could occur, heads or tails, uh, how often will that particular outcome come up? 50%. 50%. That is the distribution of that random variable, the outcome of the coin flip. Now, uh, when we're thinking about distributions, we can just describe those distributions fully, right? That is the first thing that we might want to do when we are summarizing a variable, right? Rather than sh showing you, hey, I flipped a thousand coins, the first one was heads, the second one was tails, the third one was tails, the second one, the fourth one was heads, and so on and so on and so on, I can just tell you, oh yeah, I flipped a thousand coins uh, and 502 of them were heads, right? I could summarize what I have found in my data for you. When it comes to categorical variables, which again, we talked about in the last video, this is fairly easy to do because all I have to do to show you the distribution of a categorical variable is literally tell you how often each category occurred in the data. Uh, and that will give you the sample distribution of my categorical variable. So here's an example. I've got some data on colleges here. And the first variable that I'm gonna look at is the kind of degrees that those colleges award. Uh, are they two-year colleges? Uh, do they tend to offer like certificates and things that are less than two years in length to get? Or are they four-year or more degrees, bachelor's degrees, things like that? And what we see in this data from this table uh, is that I have a data set of 7,424 observations. Uh, in those observations, uh, I've got about 3,495 3, that uh, award less than two year degrees, which is 47.1% of the data that I have. And this is telling me that in the sample of data that I have, 47.1% uh, of the observations are for colleges that offer less than two-year degrees. And I can do the same thing. I can say that 22.2% offer two-year degrees and 30.7% offer four-year degrees. And this is the distribution, the sample distribution that I have in my data of this variable. And that's just literally all there is. When you have a categorical variable, that is all you need to do to fully describe the distribution of the variable. How about for continuous variables? It's a bit trickier because we can't just do this exact same thing that we did for categorical variables because for continuous variables, it's pretty unlikely that more than one observation is going to have the exact same value, right? If your income is $17,432.16 last year, uh, then, you know, even somebody with a very similar income, uh, your coworker perhaps maybe made $17,487 and 22 cents last year. Uh, and so you would be very similar to each other, but still you, you we, we're not gonna make a table with one row for every single person uh, because that would be a very long table and we'd just be looking at the data set again. So for continuous variables, uh, we tend to do one of two things. Either uh, we can turn them into categorical variables by binning them. This is a very common approach and it leads us to what is called a histogram. A histogram is basically you take a continuous variable you cut it up into bins. So instead of looking at all the values independently, you say, okay, here's the, here are the incomes from zero to 5,000. Here are the incomes from 5,000 to 10,000. Here are the incomes from 10,000 to 15,000 and so on. You count up how many people are in each of those bins and then you graph that out or you could make a table if you prefer. This here's an example of a histogram looking at the earnings of the students who went to those colleges. Uh, we can see that most students went to a college uh, where the typical earnings after graduation are between 20,000 and $40,000. So here we've just turned a continuous variable into a categorical variable or rather an ordered variable. Uh, and we have shown the number of people in each of those categories. And of course, uh, you know, ordered variables can also have a histogram or a, a categorical table like this. Um, but also we can go a bit further uh, because you know this is still leaving out a lot of the detail that is in that continuous variable. Uh, 
So uh, we can make those bins smaller to uh, help get us a bit more detailed. And then we can make them smaller again and smaller again and smaller and smaller and smaller, and smaller, and smaller until they get infinitesimally narrow and we have what is called a density distribution. A density distribution uh, is just like a histogram, except that the bins have gotten in infinitely small, so we are describing more uh, the, the, the probability of being sort of in a range around a point uh, than we are looking at the number of observations within a given bin. Uh, but it's the same idea, right? It's just a histogram with really narrow points, and it shows you how likely different outcomes are. So here we can see in this histogram that, again, the most common outcomes are somewhere in the range of like 30,000 to 35,000. That's sort of where we get the peak of our density. We see a couple observations where it's above 100,000, you know, where the average earnings of the college cohort after graduation is above 100,000, doing pretty good, uh, but it's pretty rare, like not a whole lot over there, or like 12,000, uh, where the average earnings is 12,000 or less, you know, but again, pretty rare. And we can tell that it's pretty rare because there's some, the, the line's just not that high down there. There's not a lot of area underneath the line at that point. So at this point, we have fully described the distribution of these variables, either categorical or something we can you know, bin up. And we've just literally described the entire distribution by showing you the proportion in each of those categories. Uh, or we have a density distribution for a continuous variable that shows us the probability of landing uh, sort of in a range. Uh, technically, we're looking at a density here, not a probability, but it's the same idea, right? The numbers are going to be different, but the idea is the same. But we probably want to summarize a bit more than that, because even just showing somebody a density distribution is still a lot of information. What can we do with it? And from this, we would go on to summary statistics. Now, there are a lot of ways to summarize a variable uh, in a bit more you know, parsimoniously uh, with a bit less detail than just showing them the entire distribution. I mean, there's two main ways to go about it, at least when you're talking about continuous variables. One way is mean-based statistics, and the other is percentile-based statistics. And those, these are the two most common ways that you would see. Mean-based statistics work with the mean, the average mean, uh, which you can get by adding up all the values and then dividing by how many values you have. And what this tends to get you is a, is a value that's sort of representative of the, you know, if you, the average value. If you were betting on what this value was going to be, you'd break even if you bet the mean. That's what we'd get. And the mean is what's called a central tendency. Uh, it is a single value that is supposed to describe sort of what the center of the distribution, the most single representative value of that distribution. If you look on a density graph, you know, if you have a graph that sort of has a nice little bell curve shape, in the middle of that bell curve, uh, we're gonna see what we're looking for, that's our central tendency, sort of what all the data is centered around. So that's a mean-based statistic, right? We're, we're summing up all the values, we're dividing by how many values we get to, get to get something that is representative of the kind of value that you tend to get back from this distribution. On the other side, we have percentiles. Now what a percentile is, is if you look at this distribution and you draw a line somewhere, and then you say, okay, what's the probability of being to the left of this line? Uh, that is the percentile of that value, right? So for example, let's say that we take 100 people and we line them up in order of their height, all right? Uh, now we would go to the shortest end of the line and we would maybe go to the fifth person and say, okay, how tall are you, fifth person in line? Maybe this person is four foot, 10 inches tall, okay? Now in that case, because they're the fifth person in line, 5% of the sample is on their side of the line and 95% of the sample is everybody else. So if this person is four foot, 10 inches tall, that means that four foot, 10 inches tall is the fifth percentile. Right. It is the proportion of the sample, proportion of the data that has a value lower than that value. Right. Now, this can be handy. So because if we think about a different kind of central tendency, the median, the median is whoever is standing in the middle of that distribution. If you line all the observations up from least to most, whichever one is right in the center, that is going to be our median, the 50th percentile. And this can be handy because it is not as sensitive to things like outliers, right? If you line up 100 people by income, uh, the person in the middle with the middle income, let's say they got $30,000 of income. If Jeff Bezos walks in the room, well, then it just shifts from the third person with 30,000 to whoever is standing next to them. Maybe that's 31,000, right? Whereas the mean uh, would go from maybe 30,000 to, I don't know, 100,000 once you average out Jeff Bezos's income with everybody else, right? So then it would be a little bit weird. Uh, percentiles are handy in this way, right? They're not as sensitive to outliers. They're also a little bit harder to work with mathematically, so there's some downsides to them as well. But what you get is sort of a value that is representative of the observations. Means give you something that is sort of representative of the typical value you're going to get back, whereas a median gives you something that is representative of the typical kind of observation you're going to see. Uh, so they sort of serve different purposes. So these are the two kinds of central tendencies that we see with the mean-based uh, approach and the percentile-based approach. But in both cases, we are also interested not just in what that central tendency is, but also in how things are varied around that central tendency, right? 
different variables are either really spread out or really narrowly distributed. So for example, uh, take the number of children that somebody has. Now on average, in a lot of countries, the average number of children that an adult has is like two, something like two. Oh, but that varies a lot, right? Some people have zero children, some people have one children, some people have 10 children, right? It varies quite a bit around that central tendency. Uh, compare that to something like how many eyes somebody has. Uh, now, pr nearly everybody's gonna have exactly two eyes. Some people are gonna have one, some people are gonna have zero, maybe there's a couple people out there with three, right? But in general, m almost everybody's gonna have two eyes. So the number of children that people have is a variable with a central tendency of two and a lot of spread around that central tendency. Whereas the number of eyes that somebody has is a variable with a central tendency of two, but very little variation around that central tendency. So when we're talking about mean-based summary statistics, the way to describe the spread around a central tendency is the standard deviation or variance. Uh, this basically says, hey, we have a standard deviation. You have two eyes. We got somebody over here with uh, only one eye. Uh, they have one less eye than the typical number of eyes, the, cent the, cent the central tendency number of eyes. We will then square that. We'll average out everybody's squares. We'll take the mean of everybody's squares, right? We're still working with means. And then we're gonna take the square root back to get to our original value. Uh, and so this would describe sort of how much there is around, like we're taking what our values are, subtracting out the mean, and then, you know, taking the average of, on average, how far away from the mean are things, right? That's the idea with the standard deviation. I'll leave it to the book for the more technical details on that. On the percentile things, the typical way of describing the spread is the interquartile range, which simply looks at the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, and sees how far apart they are. And percentile summary statistics are in general more flexible in terms of describing this spread because it doesn't have to be 25 and 75. You could do 10 and 90. Uh, you could do anything, right? Just sort of describes how far apart uh, the given percentiles are from that central tendency, right? If the 10th percentile is really, really far from the 50th percentile, then you have a lot of spread over there. Uh, the 10th percentile is almost the same as it is, right? Which probably is the case for like eyes. Uh, probably the 10th percentile of people with eyes have two eyes and probably the 50th percentile also have two eyes, right? Not a lot of spread there. Uh, whereas the 10th percentile of children is probably zero, uh, and the 50th percentile is two. That's a bit of a spread there. Now, it's important that we have both these central tendency descriptions and also these spread distributions, because we want to know our central tendencies sort of give us an idea of you know, what the values kind of look like in general. What is the average, right? We're getting an averages here. Whereas the spread we need to know about, because it's important for us to know, hey, how much does this vary, right? A variable that varies very little uh, is going to be very different in terms of how you use it from a variable that varies a whole lot use the term vary a lot there. One last thing I want to mention briefly uh, is that things don't just have to be central tendencies or spread. Uh, this sort of implies that everything is symmetric around that one mean, right? There's a mean and then you're an average or, or a median and then you have a spread around it. But it doesn't have to be equal like that, right? Maybe this side has very little spread and this side has a lot of spread, right? This is something that you see with uh, skew. Skew is a description of how varied things are in, in one direction only. Uh, so for example, a common uh, variable with skew is income. With income, you have a lot of people with a relatively similar amount of income sort of down near the bottom. And then you have a couple of people who are, boom, way out on the side, right? This is the Jeff Bezos example that we talked about earlier. Now, when you have this, uh, you know, simply knowing the central tendency and the spread is not gonna tell you that much because uh, it will leave out the fact that that spread is really just on one side and not the other. Uh, here's an example of a graph that uh, looks at income. And you can see here that most of the, of the, of the distribution is down near the bottom. And however, there are still a couple of really big observations that make us need to stretch that distribution all the way out to the right. Uh, and when we have this, by the way, a common thing that you might do is take the logarithm of this data. Uh, under a couple of assumptions that we can make, if you take the logarithm of a skewed variable, it will take those really, really big observations and it will sort of shrink them in uh, to be a little bit more uh, comparable to our, the other kinds of the data. Uh, which allows you to analyze this variable without sort of being completely distracted by those really enormous uh, values. So here's an example of what that distribution might look like after we take the logarithm. You can see that it's not perfect, but it does look a lot more symmetric. We don't necessarily need our variables to be symmetric in order to describe them properly, uh, but it, for some calculations, especially ones that are based on means, they're going to do a little bit better of a job of accurately describing what the data looks like if the data looks so, sort of symmetric-ish at least. And so that is a trick that we can use when we do have skewed data, which pops up a lot in the real world uh, in order to bring things back in a little bit, make them a little bit easier to work with. All right, that's what we've covered so far when we're talking about describing what our data looks like. 
Uh, we describe our distribution. We see what that distribution looks like. If it's a categorical variable, we might just be done. Uh, if it is a continuous variable, we will have a nice density distribution, which in itself will be quite informative, but we will probably want to summarize further, uh, perhaps with a central tendency to get at a general idea of what the value tends to be, either representative of the value with the mean or representative of the observation with the median. We also want to know about the spread of that distribution around that central tendency, uh, which in the world of means can be the standard deviation or the variance, and the world of medians can be something like the interquartile spread, comparing a low percentile to a high percentile. In the next video, we're going to talk about how to use these distributions and the descriptions of these distributions to learn a little bit more about what's really going on uh, in the real world. Thank you.